Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul. Hopefully you're having an amazing day. In this video, I'm going to discuss several rumors I've been hearing for both AMD and NVIDIA. Now, of course, this will be discussing products, but I also want to discuss strategy and how NVIDIA, for example, are viewing the competition that they're facing from both AMD and also Intel, as well as some other bits and pieces as well. I find it rather fascinating actually. We will however quickly begin with RDNA 3, specifically Narve 31, as I've actually got a few performance targets that I'd like to just go over. Now we've already been hearing about how many times more powerful Narve 31 is going to be than the 6900 XT, but I also have T-flop figures and some other bits and pieces that we'll quickly go over in just a second. But first, a word from this video's sponsor. If you're running a copy of Windows 10, which is not activated, of course, not only do you have to worry about the missing customization options, but there's also that annoying Windows desktop watermark reminding you to activate. Today's video is sponsored by whokeys.com, and they have an excellent price on Windows 10 Professional, as well as home keys. Yeah, and they also, of course, sell games. I've bought a few Windows 10 keys with my own personal account to test everything was legit and worked in preparation for this sponsored video. You can pick up one of their keys for 25% off using the coupon code RGT in the checkout. There's links to their website in the video description. Also, if you're building a few systems, there's bundles available too. Again, you can check out whokeys.com and use the coupon code RGT for 25% off the listed Windows 10 key prices. So yes, Narbo 31 is an MCM design. We all know that by now, of course. And this is a very interesting uh, strategy going forward for AMD. It's going to basically act as the linchpin to fight off NVIDIA. Now we'll discuss more about NVIDIA in just a moment, but the long story short is that the first major competitor to AMD's future graphics architectures is of course Lovelace. And Lovelace is not an MCM design, it's going to be monolithic. But neither AMD or NVIDIA are exactly going the energy efficient route here. In fact, <laughs> I'm hearing that they're quite hungry, hungry hippos for energy efficiency. And others such as Grayman on Twitter have been discussing this for quite some time as well. Now, what I find really interesting is that the early performance targets for Narve 31, I've discussed this many times at this point, so I'm just gonna go over it briefly, was 2.5 times. But then I was hearing it was more like 2.8. Now, of course, this is just natural as a, a product is being bought up. Now, I have heard that AMD were originally targeting a three times increase over the 6900 XT. But what's really interesting is that now a couple of people have told me that the T-flop targets for the highest end Narve 31 SKU is currently 75 T-flops. Now, that might sound a really high figure, but you have to remember that T-flops are... I don't want to use the word meaningless, but they are not necessarily the greatest indicator of performance. For example, if we look at the RTX 3090, this is from memory, I think it's like 36 T-flops, and the 6900 XT, I believe, is 25 T-flops, something around there. Although, of course, with how boost and, you know, base frequencies and all of that stuff works, especially on AMD cards, it becomes even more of a difficult thing to really pin down. But yes, again, I'm hearing it's going to be around 75 T-flops. And that is a very large increase, of course, from one to another. And that also does match up, of course, with that three times target. And this does make me wonder if those are the performance targets that we've been hearing. It's definitely making me go, hmm, especially given Narve 33, we've been hearing for quite some time now, is gonna be around, well, 10 to 15% faster is apparently the new target, but prior to that, it was widely heard that it was gonna be up to 50% faster than 6900 XT. In fact, I was hearing that for quite some time, but it, it was definitely a figure that really made me scratch my head, because if you think about that from a logical perspective, that is, that's a lot faster, right? I mean, a good number of gamers just wouldn't really want anything faster, especially if ray tracing performance was considerably improved as well. Again, RDNA 3 is supposedly going to be like, I, I, it was told to me anyway, it was Ampere plus one. So I'm assuming that's gonna be close to Lovelace. Again, I've discussed this previously, but, yeah, Narve 31, Narve 32, and Narve 33 are gonna be very interesting GPUs. Quite frankly, I feel that AMD are going to be doubling down on ray tracing performance. 
And to that end, I'm hearing that there's 240 RT cores essentially inside Narve 31. Again, we are referring to the highest end SKU. And in terms of WGP, the figure I've been hearing is 120, although that figure has also been banded about several times now online. Of course, again, none of these products are officially released. And personally speaking, I am super excited just to get like a block diagram, just to get a, an overall understanding of how these GPUs are put together. Because I really do not think that just saying, well, it's got like you know, an MCD and a GCD and all of that jazz, I don't think it's giving anywhere near enough credit to how complicated the design here is. You know, this is this is something that's actually, um, let's put it this way, there's, there's a lot of extra stuff on this GPU when you start to drill down into it. And it's gonna be very fascinating to me to see what AMD have done for their GPU. Now, of course, we'll discuss more about Lovelace in just a moment, but the next GPU from NVIDIA after Lovelace is essentially going to be Hopper. Now this is going to be the RTX 50 series, assuming we don't see like a major naming change. And I'm hearing that it's gonna be 2024. This has been whispered several times in the past, but this is going to be the architecture that really NVIDIA um, are going to be shooting for. Like this is the architecture that's really going to be, you know, a considerable improvement over everything they've done before. I'm hearing from many people that Hopper and RDNA 4 actually as a whole is going to be, you know, RDNA 3, basically it was explained to me quite early on that RDNA 3 is like an iteration of RDNA 2, whereas RDNA 4, it's not a completely different design. It's not like they threw away the entire thing and then just started from scratch, but there are some major fundamental changes. And I'm hearing much the same with Hopper. Now, one thing that was told to me about NVIDIA going forward is that they are going to be changing their philosophy of how they put out products. Now, for some time, of course, we've been seeing NVIDIA embrace supercards. For example, we know that RTX 20, it received super, like the RTX 2080 super, for example. And arguably, those products were actually really good. And I think that if they'd have actually released the super versions as like the launch products, Turing would have actually received a much better positive reception. Again, I think Turing was instrumental in many things, for example, like mesh shaders, it allowed the developers to like screw around with those, hardware-based ray tracing, yada, yada, yada. But it also got somewhat lambasted because in terms of traditional rasterization performance, there wasn't a huge leap immediately noticeable. And of course, a lot of that could have been solved just with the Super Series launching first, but I digress. But we know, of course, that there's going to be a super derivative. Oh, I say no, but there's a lot of rumors that we're going to see much the same with Ampere as well. Although the super series for oh, Ampere doesn't seem to be that big of a deal, at least according to all the rumors we've been seeing, maybe five-ish percent performance, perhaps a little bit more if NVIDIA just go ham on the clock frequencies and TDP just get thrown out of the window, which honestly, I'm not necessarily opposed to. Um, assuming it can be called relatively well, I don't necessarily personally care about power consumption. However, I do know that that is a personal opinion and it's not necessarily held by tons of people. Again, you know, I do understand that not everyone wants something to be drawing like 7 billion watts from their wall outlet. And, you know, there is obviously a lot of reasons that that's not necessarily a good thing. Getting back to the topic itself, though, Basically, I'm hearing that NVIDIA are going to be more adopting a tick slash tock model going forward. Now, I don't exactly have all of the details here. I only just learned this just like a day or two ago, so I'm doing some more digging, but I'm putting it out because I'm curious to see whether it stirs anything in the industry and whether anyone else has heard similar. But basically speaking, getting back to you know the super series we all know that they're basically the same architectures no major differences the only real you know change here is that they have slight bumps in specifications maybe additional memory yada 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 but i was told that it could either be on an improved process going forward so for example an rtx 40 series card let's just call it rtx 4080 may see some type of refresh which will for the sake of this video call a super 
but that super would have some more meaningful changes. And this would be introduced 12 to 18 months later. So basically you'll have like a new architecture released 24-ish months, so two years later. So it's not anything hugely different to what NVIDIA have done. In fact, if you're, <laughs> if you're old enough to remember the, what was it? I was about to say, uh, I was about to say GTX 8800, but that's not technically true. So it would be like 8800 GTX, for example. Do you remember how that architecture received kind of a a new lease in life with the, what was it, the 9000 series? It could be kind of similar to that, but I'm putting words in the person's mouth who told me this. But, you know, perhaps it could be similar. I don't necessarily mind that because graphics architectures are becoming, of course, increasingly more expensive to develop. And at the end of the day, we're also facing a lot more competition. And speaking of competition, yeah, um, NVIDIA are, of course, very aware of what AMD are doing. But something that's really interesting to me is that while, of course, they are nervous of AMD, let's just be honest, Lisa Sue and her team, they've done a lot of good work. And honestly speaking, they have drove the industry forward by several notches. Like, it's very hard to deny there's, you know, the, a lot of the groundwork that we're seeing, for example, with Zen, um, pushed the core counts up for mainstream. Zen 2, of course, introduced, well, chiplets. And naturally, the industry eventually was going to get there anyway. Like, NVIDIA way back when, I think it's like 2018, maybe, they released a paper that basically showed how, you know, MCM was kind of the future in graphics anyway. So again, the industry was going to get there. However, I do think that AMD kind of rabbit punched the industry. And yeah, NVIDIA definitely do believe that AMD are going to be very competitive going forward. However, the company that I'm hearing they're really concerned about is actually Intel, especially when it comes to mobile. Now, not too long ago, I released a video, I can't remember the exact title, but it basically was discussing the fact that XE or HPG or whatever you want to call it, is going to do well in desktop. However, the major market that AMD are, um, sorry, the Intel, that Intel are going to be focusing on initially is going to be mobile. And when you think about it, it makes a great deal of sense because this means that they've got tons of marketing development funds that they can throw at companies like Dell or HP or whomever to push an Intel plus Intel, you know, kit. And just from a marketing standpoint, this has a ton of potential. And this, of course, is making NVIDIA very uncomfortable because AMD can do much the same as well. Remember, RDNA 2 is now becoming very popular in mobile form factors. Even we're seeing, it, of course, now in um, well, cell phones. In fact, the latest news is that the cell phones themselves, they can actually support ray tracing with their custom uh, integrated RDNA 2. Now, obviously, they've only got like, what is it, three? Is it three work group processors, I think, from memory? So it's not exactly like going to be full ray trace 4K scenes or anything, but it's still very interesting because ray tracing isn't just about reflective puddles. Ray tracing can do a lot more besides, and there are many very efficient ways of doing ray tracing. I had an interview, I believe it was like 2020, I think it was like 2020 or late 2019, with AdShare who do local ray. And I've got to tell you guys, like, their software, their integration of ray tracing is really impressive. And, of course, it's not using, like, the, you know, BVH calculation uh, hardware that we see with NVIDIA or AMD. So it's really interesting to see what's going to be happening going forward. And AMD, getting back again to the topic, have a ton of potential with um, AMD plus AMD integrated you know, laptops, and it will be very interesting to see how NVIDIA move forward. And of course, this is one of the big reasons that NVIDIA wants to buy ARM. But I think that's just about it for this particular video. Again, I just wanted to discuss some of this stuff with you because I found it kind of interesting. And some of the things I just haven't kind of squeezed into other videos, um, just because they didn't really seem to fit in the topic. So I just thought I'd just throw them all into this one. Hopefully, though, you have enjoyed the video. As usual, if you have, then, of course, subscribe to the channel and leave a likey because it's YouTube land. And I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Stay safe. Bye for now.